LPC 313X Product Overview Module In this module, we'll cover the following topics Introduction, Memory Support, Clock Generation Unit, Peripherals, Power Management, and Tools Introduction Within Introduction, we'll cover three main areas The Key Family Features, Family Overview, and the Block Diagram Listed are the key features of the LPC 313X 180 MHz ARM 926EJ-S core High speed USB OTG solution with on chip Phi The LPC 3130 is priced under $3 at 10K units Huge internal SRAM The LPC 3131 is equipped with 192KB and the LPC 3130 is equipped with 96KB dynamic clock gating and scaling and finally the chip is equipped with multiple power domains the LPC 313X series is the industry's lowest cost ARM 926 solution with high speed OTG and integrated PHY LPC 313X series the series comes in two flavors LPC 3130 and LPC 3131 both devices come with the same operating frequency of 180 MHz. The peripheral set also remains the same and includes a USB high-speed OTG controller, 10-bit A to D, I2S, I2C interfaces and external memory interfaces. The only difference is in the internal RAM size which is reduced to 96K for LPC3130. Let's do an overview of the LPC 313X block diagram. At the very top, we have the four main masters in the LPC 313X system. The ARM 926 instruction and data bus, DMA controller and OTG controller. Here we have the internal and external memories. On the right, you can see the internal ROM and the two banks of 96 kilobyte SRAM. Supporting external memories are the NAND flash controller, multipurpose memory controller and the MCI interfaces. Let's look at the key peripherals starting with APB slave group 0. Here we have the all important CGU unit that provides clocks to all the modules in the chip. This group also includes the 10 bit A to D and the event router. On slave group 1, we have timers and I2C interfaces. On slave group 2, we have an LCD interface, SPI, UART and PCM interfaces. On slave group 3, we have the I2S interfaces. The key point here is that the APB clock should be the same as the AHP clock. Finally, we have slave group 4 on which the NAND and DMA registers reside. Connecting all these blocks together is the multilayer AHB bus matrix. AHB bus masters. Before we get into the matrix, let's look at an image that clearly shows the different bus masters. There are four interfaces on the master port DMA. ARM 926 instruction port, ARM 926 data port, and USB OTG. AHP bus matrix. Now that we are aware of the AHP bus masters, let's look at the slaves and the complete system. There are 14 slave ports in this system. All the slaves interconnect with the masters over the bus matrix. There are several advantages of a multi-layer AHP bus matrix. It allows increased bandwidth in comparison to one layer with more than one master. The master to slay mixing can be done without arbitration. The arbitration effectively becomes point arbitration at each peripheral and is only necessary when more than one master wants to access the same slave simultaneously. Prioritizing AHP masters. As shown in the image, a register is provided that can help the application to prioritize the four AHP masters. This is an excellent feature 
as it not only gives the option of four masters but also provides a way to prioritize the four independent systems. This feature might be particularly useful for DMA operations. Let's look at the memory support of the LPC313X series. Internal memories. As shown in the image, the internal memory support includes the internal ROM memory that contains the boot code. The boot ROM is not accessible to the user. The boot ROM also contains 16 kilobytes of predefined MMU tables that could be useful for configuring simple systems. You can see this has an extra savings of 16 kilobytes of your internal SRAM. The boot ROM also contains CRC32 lookup tables for CRC computation. In the common driver library package that is provided by NXP, you will find a driver that uses this facility. There are two 96 kilobyte SRAM banks in the LPC3131 and one bank in the LPC3130. With a two-bank approach, you can structure the code such that the instruction can be compiled to bank 0 and the stacks can go to bank 1. The advantage of this approach would be that the ARM instruction port will use a separate AHP layer while the ARM data port uses another layer thereby avoiding bus contention and improving overall system performance. External Memory Support this device has extensive support for external memories. The NAND flash controller is used to transfer data between the LPC313X and external NAND flash devices. The multiport memory controller MPMC supports the interface to a large number of memory types such as SDRAM, LPSD RAM, flash, synchronous micron flash, ROM, and memory map devices such as Ethernet controllers, FPGAs, etc. MCI is an interface between the AHB and the memory card. It supports SD memory, SDIO, multimedia cards, and the CEATA interface. Let's look at the key features of the NAND flash controller. Automatic flow control with DMA controller, two SRAMs of 132 words used for double buffering, support for 8-bit and 16-bit NAND flash devices. The LBC313X has support for 528 bytes, 2K and 4K pages NAND flash devices. Support for large page flash, that is 2K and 4K, is achieved by organizing the large pages into multiple small subpages. Support for four NAND flash devices in parallel with dedicated chip selects, Error correction, ECC5 and ECC8 are available. A programming guide is also provided in the user's manual. Some key features of the multiport memory controller are as follows. The MPMC supports dynamic and static memories. Dynamic memory. Support for 16-bit wide SDRAM, JDEC low power SDRAM and Micron flash. The LPC313X can interface to 16-bit wide SDRAM only. That means you could connect one 16-bit device or two 8-bit devices. For dynamic memories, the self-refresh mode is also supported. Static memory. For static memory, 8 and 16-bit wide memories are supported. One chip select for dynamic and two for static memory devices. The MPMC contains four 16-word data buffers that are used for read and write operations. Some special programming notes for the MPMC. The MPMC contains a clock called MPMC underscore CFG underscore CLK underscore 3 that is not influenced by variable clock scaling and it is used to generate the refresh pulses towards SDRAM. The MPMC is configured in the SysReg section. External Bus Interface EBI The EBI module acts as a multiplexer and handles the arbitration between the NAND flash and the SDRAM SRAM memory modules that are externally connected through the MPMC. The main purpose of using the EBI module is to save external pins. However, only data and address pins are multiplexed. 
control signals towards and from the external memory devices are not multiplexed. In total, three external memory controller interface ports are available on the EBI module. On the LPC313X, only two ports are used. Port 1 for the MPMC and Port 2 for the NAND flash controller. Port 3 is not connected. On the right hand side you will notice a 16-bit address and data lines that are connected to the external memories. The EBI module has an internal arbitration mechanism which does not need any programming. The only thing which can be programmed is the priority of the different ports. This can be done by programming values in the EBI timeout value 1 register which resides in the SysReg module. The lower the programmed value is, the higher will be the priority of that port. By default in the LPC313X, port 1 which handles the MPMC has the highest priority. Port 2 which handles the NAND flash and port 3 which is not used have equal priority. Let's look at the key features of the memory card interface MCI. The MCI acts like an interface between the AHB and the memory card. It supports SD, SDIO, multimedia cards MMC and consumer electronics ATA interface. Some additional notes. The MCI supports 8-bit mode for MMC Plus and eMMC devices. The SD card should be 3.3 volts. NAND flash operation may not be possible in 8-bit mode. Moving on to the next point, it supports CRS generation and error detection and finally the MCI also supports SDIO. Booting. The LPC313X has an internal 128KB ROM memory which carries the boot code. The code supports booting from SPI flash, NAND flash, SD MMC cards, UART and USB. It contains 16 kilobyte of predefined MMU tables which can be used for configuring simple systems and supports an option to perform CRC32 checking on the boot image. Booting process. The design of the LPC313X is such that the first 4 kilobyte page of the ROM is shadowed upon reset over the first 4 kilobyte page of the address space of the processor. This ensures that the first code executed in the system is the boot code of the ROM. The boot ROM determines the boot mode based on the reset state of GPIO0, GPIO1 and GPIO2 pins. The table shows the different GPIO settings and the different boot options they enable. Let's look at these options in more detail. Booting flow. The flowchart shows the different boot options. The boot options are broken up into three groups. Options where the image is copied from external memory is shown in red. Options where the image is downloaded from USB or UART is shown in blue. And finally we have a test mode that is shown in green. Boot ROM copies or downloads the image to internal SRAM at location 0x1102-9000 and jumps to that location. Hence the images for LPC313X should be compiled with entry point at 0x1102-9000. If the booting experiences any problems, it is indicated to the external world via GPIO pins. Wrapping up with the final features, final key points for booting. Several boot options give a lot of options to the end application. Detailed programming guides are available in the user's manual. The boot ROM expects the DFU image to be TEA encrypted. TEA stands for Tiny Encryption Algorithm. Maximum boot image is 128 kilobytes for LPC3131 and 80 kilobytes for LPC3130. Image formatting tool is present in the CDL. Clock generation unit CGU. The CGU is the most important unit in the LPC313X and in this section we will cover the following topics. Input clocks, 
We will try to understand selection stage, spreading stage, clock gating, scaling, clock switching, and finally clock wake up. Let's look at the big picture. The CGU is used for deriving all the clocks in the LPC313X. Let's look at the key blocks of the CGU going from left to right. Reference clock is generated by the oscillator with an external 12 MHz crystal. Programmable system clock frequency is generated by the system PLL. And programmable audio clock frequency is generated by the audio PLL. A highly flexible switch box is integrated to distribute the signals from the clock sources to the module clocks. Four external signals arrive from the I2S interfaces that are fed directly to the switch box and also act like inputs for the two PLLs. The two external clock signals from the I2S pins are used for generating audio frequencies. Both the system PLL and the audio PLL generate their frequencies based on one of the five input clocks that arrive from the oscillator and the I2S pins. So in all, seven input clocks are generated to the internal switch box. Now let's transfer our focus on the switch box. The switch box generates 12 base clocks. Each clock generated by the CGU is derived from one of these base clocks and optionally divided by a fractional divider. In subsequent slides, we will do a detailed review of the base clocks that enable a variety of features including clock scaling. The base clocks then go on to generate 92 module clocks. There are two main stages in the switch box, selection stage and spreading stage. We will visit these concepts as well in the next few slides. Before going deeper into the CGU, let's review the input clocks. Input clocks arrive from the I2S interfaces. Two system PLLs are provided. Input frequency can range from 5 kHz to 50 MHz. A USB PLL is also provided and it is configured in the system register module. CGU switch box. Let's understand the selection stage by analyzing the 12 base clocks. On the left, we can see the 7 input clocks that are generated from the oscillator, I2S inputs and the PLLs. On the right, the 12 base clocks that are generated by the switch box are introduced. Let's take a moment to review those 12 base clocks. The next slide will show which parts of the system would the base clocks affect. Each of these base clocks can choose any of the seven input clocks as their source. This stage of the CGU is called the selection stage. Understanding the 12 base clocks. So how do the 12 base clocks spread across the system? To explain this more clearly, let's revisit the block diagram. Let's start with the SIS base clock. This clock would undoubtedly be the most important clock of the system as it provides clock to the core, AHB clock to the AHB matrix, internal memories and the external memory interface. Next would be the APP0 base clock. This base clock provides the APP clock to the event router, ADC, system registers and the random number generator. APB1 base clock. This base clock provides clock to general purpose timers, PWM and I2C. APB2 base clock. This base clock provides APB clock to PCM, UART, LCD and SPI interfaces. In addition to this base clock, the PCM and UART interfaces need additional base clocks for timing and baud regeneration respectively. Similarly, SPI needs an additional clock for the main clock of the SPI module. Finally, let's look at slave group 3 where the remaining 4 base clocks find their usage. Most of these base clocks would be used in an audio intensive application. Let's understand the spreading stage by analyzing the generation of the 92 module 
clocks. On the right, you can see the table listing all the base clocks. Each base clock results in a separate clock domain. Each base clock also has a set of fractional divider registers. For example, the first base clock, sysbase, has, has got 8 fractional dividers. The second base clock, AHP underscore APP0 underscore base, has got 2 fractional dividers, and so on. All output clocks or module clocks in one domain follow the same base clock or optionally one of the fractional dividers. Since all module clocks in a particular domain are generated from the same base clock, they have the same frequency and are also synchronous. If we consider all the individual clocks, a total of 92 module clocks are generated from the CGU. Let's look at an example for module clock generation. Let's consider AHB underscore APB0 underscore base clock. For sake of simplicity, we will refer to this clock as APB0. This base clock provides the APB clock to the event router, ADC, system registers and the random number generator. This clock domain also has two fractional dividers at its disposal, fractional divider 7 and fractional divider 8. This domain generates 10 module clocks from 30 to 39 as shown in the slide. Now, all these module clocks will either follow APB0 or fractional divider 7 or fractional divider 8. All module clocks will have the same frequency and they will also be synchronous. This is termed as the spreading stage of the CGU. Dynamic clock switching for base clocks. To enable dynamic clock switching, each base clock is provided with two switches. Frequency select registers are provided for each switch that enable the selection of the input clock source. Because it takes a certain amount of time to switch between frequency 1 and frequency 2, care must be taken when switching to and from very low speed clocks. There may be significant delay between the clock switching pro clock switch programming and the actual clock activation. The SSR register can be used by software to wait for a clock switch to complete. All frequency select registers in the clock switch box are reset to zero, making the 12 MHz clock has a default clock source. Let's talk about dynamic clock gating. In software, clocks to individual blocks can be enabled or disabled through the power control register. External enabling. Signals from outside the switch box can be used to enable certain module clocks related to the event router, CGU, SysReg, SPI, PWM, PCM, IOConfig and the ADC. For example, the clock provided to the event router block is used during register reads and writes only. Since this clock need not run all the time, by setting the external enable bit for the clock, CGU will generate this clock only when there is a read or write request. After the request is completed, the CGU will automatically switch the clock off, thereby conserving power. Let's talk about dynamic clock scaling. The sys underscore base clock domain has seven dynamic fractional dividers that are considered partner registers for FTC0 to FTC6. These registers will need to have slower clock settings as compared to the fractional divider registers. When the, fractional, when the, when the dynamic fractional dividers are enabled, the LPC313X will automatically switch to the slow clocks when there is no AHP bus activity. Let's look at the key features of dynamic clock scaling. The sys underscore base clock domain has partner dynamic fractional divider registers. When the partner registers are enabled, fractional divider contents become the high speed settings. The dynamic fractional divider contents become the slow speed settings. The dynamic fractional dividers allow hardware, mostly the AHP bus masters, to directly control the speed of the AHP bus. This will give several advantages. Hardware will decide the most optimum AHP frequency. 
software engineers do not have to decide the optimum AHB frequency for their application. The hardware will do this as efficiently as possible. The fast clock will only be needed when data needs to be transferred. This means that when data does not need to be transferred, the AHP bus and its connected IP will consume very little power. Maximum Frequencies The table shows the maximum clock speeds for the AHP matrix and the ARM9 core at different voltage levels. The maximum throughput for, from, the AL, from the LPC313X is achieved at 1.2 volts. Also a point to note could be that the voltage levels on the LPC313X can be lowered all the way to 0.9 volts. Keep in mind the dynamic clock scaling concept so that you can automatically lower the power consumption when there is no bus activity. Tips for CGU Let's end this section by discussing some tips that will help you navigate through the CGU in the quickest way possible. The CGU chapter provides a programming section providing useful tips that will enable you to program the block. Nearly every chapter in the user's manual is equipped with a section for clock signals and power optimization. The CGU block in the LPC313X is pretty flexible, so proper care should be taken in software to program the clocks. Try to use the CGU driver provided in the NXP CDL package as your reference. Let's start the exploration on the different peripherals starting with the event router. Event router. The event router extends the interrupt capability of the system by offering a flexible and versatile way of generating interrupts. Combined with the wake up functionality of the CGU, it also offers a way to wake up the system from suspend mode. Let's look at the big picture. The event router has four interrupt outputs that are connected to the interrupt controller and one wake up output connected to the CGU. The output signals are activated when an event, for instance a rising edge, is detected on one of the input signals. The input signals of the event router are numerous and are connected to the internal control signals in the system or to external signals through pins of the LPC313X. Events, Bank 0 and Bank 1. All input event signals connected to the event router are grouped together in banks. If the number of input signals is larger than 32, the next bank is used. For example, signal 33 becomes bit 0 of bank 1 and so on. In the next two slides, we have shown what kind of events are captured in each bank. Events that are marked in green are internal signals. This slide shows the different signals that are routed to bank 2 and bank 3. In the user's manual, a complete register bank is provided under the banner of int out registers that enable the application to configure the different events to be routed to either the event controller and or the CGU. Vectored interrupt controller. The interrupt controller decodes all the interrupt requests issued by the on-chip 29 interrupt sources. Software interrupt request capability is associated with each interrupt request. Nesting of interrupts is supported and interrupts routed to IRQ and to FIQ are vectored. Let's look at vectored operation. The image is showing a typical interrupt vector table. The core uses the int vector register which contains the base address of the table and the index number to index into this table. Each entry in the table is a combination of a vector and a priority limiter. The vector is used to branch off to the respective ISR and the priority limiter is used for nesting control. The priority limiter is a variable that determines a priority threshold that incoming interrupt request must exceed to trigger interrupt request towards the processor. USB high speed OTG with on chip phi. Listed on the slide are the key features of the USB high-speed OTG controller. The OTG controller is complemented by the UTMI Plus compliant transceiver. The LPC313X supports four endpoints and supports all four transfer types including isochronous. The boot ROM implements the device firmware upgrade class that could be useful for field updates. 
For transmit, the endpoint size is 128 by 36 bits and for receive, the endpoint size is 256 by 36 bits. USB block on this chip has a dual port RAM for buffering endpoint data. For each in endpoint, a 128 by 36 bit buffer is allocated to meet the strict timing requirements of the USB 2.0 high speed spec. On the receive side, single 256 by 36 bit buffer is shared between multiple out endpoints. Random number generator RNG. The RNG generates through random numbers. Two independent ring oscillator clocks feed the RNG clock inputs. They provide a source clock which varies from device to device depending on the VLSI technology process and the device's own temperature. Because of this unstable clock source, the random numbers generated are highly unpredictable. Therefore, it is very unlikely that two random number generators in two different systems will generate the same random number sequence at any point in time. Some key features of this block are mentioned on the slide. I2S Interfaces The I2S bus specification defines a three-wire serial bus having one data, one clock and one word select signal. The basic I2S connection has one master which is always a master and one slave. The I2S interface on the LPC313X provides a separate transmit and receive channel. The receive supports both master and slave modes whereas the transmit supports the master mode only. In addition to supporting single 16 and 24 bit for the left or right FIFO, it also supports 32 bit interleaved transfers. The FIFOs can hold four stereo samples and this interface is supported by the DMA. Let's wind up with the remaining peripherals starting with the DMA controller. The 12 channel DMA has support for the following transfer types memory to memory, memory to peripheral and peripheral to memory. For the memory to peripheral and peripheral to memory transfer types the flow is controlled by the peripheral. The controller supports single data transfers for all transfer types and supports burst transfers for memory to memory transfers. Supports swapping in Indianness of the transported data for file reading or MP3 decoding purposes. Finally, it supports the scatter and gather feature where two DMA channels are used to gather data which is located in different areas of the memory. This slide shows the different blocks of the LPC313X that supports DMA. LCD Interface The LCD interface contains logic to interface to 6800 and 8080 compatible LCD controllers with 4, 8 and 16 bit modes. This module also supports a serial interface mode. The speed of the interface can be adjusted in software to match the speed of the connected LCD display. A system that uses the LCD interface block cannot have external SDRAM since the external memory address lines are muxed with the LCD interface lines. Some key features of the LCD interface are as follows. Multiple frequencies are selectable to support high and low speed LCD controllers. Supports polling of the busy flag from the LCD controller to offload the CPU from polling. Contains a 16 byte FIFO for sending control and data information to the LCD controller. Supports maskable interrupts and finally supports DMA transfers. GPIO The GPIO pins can be controlled through the register interface provided in the input output configuration module. The input output configuration module provides the following features. The pin could operate in normal operation which would be controlled by the function block. The pin could be driven low, it could be driven high or it could be held in high impedance. The register interface provides set and reset access methods for choosing the operational mode. The IO config module is reset by a synchronous APP bus reset. For all functional pins controlled by the IO config registers, the reset signals the reset signal sets all the mode bits in such a way that the subsystem modules themselves control their output at reset. 
Similarly, if the pins are GPIO only, that would be GPIO 0 to GPIO 20, they are set as inputs at reset. SPI Key Features The Serial Peripheral Interface module is used for synchronous serial data communication with other devices that support the SPI or SSI protocol. Some key features are as follows. It supports the Motorola Anti-I frame formats. Maximum speed in master mode is 45 MHz and slave mode is 25 MHz. Multiple slave support up to three slaves has separate 64 words deep TX and RX FIFOs. Let's look at the SPI master operation in a little more detail. The SPI master supports up to three chip selects that can be used to interface to three slaves. Depending, up, depending on the operating mode selected, the chip select will operate as an active high frame synchronization output for TI's SSI or an active low chip select for SPI. The master can operate in two modes. In normal transmission mode, software intervention is needed each time a new slave needs to be addressed. And in sequential slave mode, the SPI master will sequentially transmit data to slaves as long as data is available in the FIFO. Data can be retransmitted without the need for refilling the FIFO. UART. Listed on the slide are the key features of the UART interface. The UART block is fully compliant with the 16 c 50 mode. It supports the NHP mode which helps you to avoid unintentional 5.4 reads. Programmable baud rate and automatic modem flow control are some of its key features. 2 I2C interfaces are supported on the LPC313X. I2C0 is I2C bus compliant with open drain pins. It supports multi-master operation and supports powering off the device. I2C1 uses standard I.O. pins and supports only single master mode. The interfaces support both normal and fast speeds. The both interfaces support DMA transfers. Timers. The LPC313X contains four fully independent timer modules that can be used to generate interrupts after a preset time interval has elapsed. It supports two modes of operation, free running and periodic. In free running, the timer generates an interrupt when the counter reaches zero. The timer wraps around at the highest value and continues counting down. In periodic timer mode, the timer also generates an interrupt when the counter reaches zero. However, it reloads the value from a load register and continues counting down from that value. An interrupt will be generated every time the counter reaches zero. This effectively gives a repeated interrupt at a regular interval. PWM The PWM module supports pulse density modulation. A PDM signal is a stream of constant width pulses having a density proportional to a corresponding digital value. Some key features of the PWM are mentioned on the slide. The image shown provides a snapshot of both of PWM and PDM generation. Watchdog Timer The LPC313X contains a watchdog module that can be used to generate a software reset in case of a CPU or software crash. The watchdog timer can also be used as an ordinary timer. The block is configured for two match registers and each match register is 32 bits wide. As a watchdog, match 1 output is used for generating an event to the CGU which requests a reset. As a timer, match 0 output is used for generating an event to the event router which generates an interrupt to the interrupt controller. Listed on the slide are the key features of the 10-bit ADC. This device has a programmable ADC resolution from 2 to 10 bits. The clock speed is set at 4.5 MHz. Measuring range is 0 to 3.3 volts. Single and continuous scan is supported. Four analog input channels with individual reset registers. 
the conversion rate will be 400k samples per second for 10 bit resolution and 1500k samples per second for 2 bit resolution. Power management Dynamic clock gating Some module clocks are only active when bus access to the module is required. All module clocks can be disabled individually for flexible power optimization. Using the sys-based clock, dynamic clock scaling is possible that allows for automatic power optimization of the AHP bus. High clock frequency is used when the bus is active and low clock frequency is used when the bus is idle. Clock wake up feature. Module clocks can be programmed to be activated automatically on the basis of an external event which can be detected by the event router. An example of the use of this feature would be that all clocks including the ARM bus clocks are off and activated automatically when a button is pressed. Multiple I.O. Domains The image shows a simplified version of the multiple power domains in the LPC313X. The LCD interface and the MPMC are multiplexed allowing for the two modes of operation MPMC and LCD. In MPMC mode, the supply voltage for SDRAM, SRAM or bus-based LCD and the NAND flash must be the same. The dedicated LCD interface is not available in this mode. In LCD mode, the NAND flash supply voltage can be different from the LCD supply voltage. The external NAND flash is accessible in both modes. The multiple power domains give flexibility to board designers to use different voltage paths. For example, while using mobile SD ramps which are usually 1.8 volt devices, there will be no need to use voltage translators since SD ram lines are in a separate voltage domain. So they can be configured at 1.8 volts while the rest of the IO pins are in a 3.3 volt domain. Similarly, in LCD mode, we could have separate voltage level to the LCD compared to the NAND flash and other peripherals. Let's look at the tool support for the LPC31XX series. Let's look at the tool support for the LPC313X series. The embedded artist LPC3131 OEM board which is mounted on LPC31XX baseboard gets you up and running quickly with the LPC313X series. The OEM board has a SODIMM format and is perfect for running Linux with large onboard RAM and flash. All processor signals are available on the 200 POS connector for easy expansion. An expansion connector is also available for a 3.2 inch QVGA TFT color LCD with touch panel. Please visit the shown web link for complete details on pricing. LPC313X board video presentation. Embedded Artist also provides a video presentation on the evaluation board. The shown web link will direct you to the web page. Common Driver Library or CDL from NXP. This software package provides a generic set of drivers which highlight how specific peripherals and functions work. This software package also comes bundled with the both support package for the Embedded Artist Development Board. The both support package will include startup code and examples, which can be easily built and executed using any of the supported tool chains. Listed on the slide are some of the key features of the Common Driver Library. Also please note that this package is free to use with the LPC313X series of microcontrollers. Linux support for LPC313X. NXP provides a Linux board support package that supports most of the peripherals of the LPC313X, LPC314X and LPC315X series of microcontrollers as well as several target boards. This board support package is maintained by NXP and is periodically updated with issue fixes and new features. The easiest way to get started with Linux and the LPC313X microcontrollers is to download the quick start guide and follow the steps to build and deploy a complete Linux system on the Embedded Artist LPC3131 board. The quick start guide will provide the quickest and easiest method to get the necessary tools and software 
to build the Linux images and the root file system. Complete listing of tools. A complete listing of tools and software packages for the LPC 313X series or any of our LPC MCUs can be found by browsing to our comprehensive tools guide that is available online at the shown web link. This brings us to an end of the LPC 313X product model presentation. Please leave your feedback and any suggestions that you might have in the comment box. Your inputs will help us improve the training experience in the LPC zone. We are adding new training modules all the time at www.nxp.com slash LPC zone. So we encourage you to register and we will send you email updates when new videos get uploaded. Thanks for watching this video and we look forward to seeing you again.